Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this festive episode, we are going to explore some of the strange traditions associated with Christmas in Wales, and in particular, we are going to focus on the music, because there was much merriment, much partying, much singing, much dancing, even a little bit of the Mary Lloyd. But at the heart of these celebrations was music. And I don't mean nice, polite church Christmas music, but the kind of music that went on all day, all night, and was accompanied by debauchery and the odd bit of fisticuffs. And this all took place during the 12 days of Christmas. Maybe a better name would have been the 12 days of carnage, as you will find out. Because while Christmas might have been very much a sacred time for the pious, it was also a time for partying. It could be described as a never-ending party in Victorian Wales. Now, the folklore on this episode comes courtesy of an old favourite of mine, Wirt Sykes, the American folklorist who spent some time in Wales in the late 19th century. And I think Sykes is perfect for this kind of episode because not only did he experience all of this firsthand, he didn't just look this up in some dusty old book. He put on his walking shoes and he went out to explore. He went to the pubs and the churches and he joined in with the celebrations. He took part in the celebrations himself. And what also makes Sykes great for this kind of episode is that he was indeed an American. This gives us an outsider's perspective, as it were, on the events. So rather than just taking the words of some passionate Welshman, we are getting the views of hopefully an impartial observer experiencing the wild and wonderful Christmases of Wales for the first time later in his life. And very quickly before we get on with the good stuff, but as I've mentioned before, I find it amazing just how many people tune into this podcast from North America. And so this Christmas episode goes out to everyone on the other side of the Atlantic, especially here's an American's view of Christmas in Wales. So let's dive straight in with this festive folklore. And to begin at the beginning, Sykes tells us that Christmas time is the most interesting holiday season of the year among Christian peoples. And while most countries have a variety of customs peculiar to it. In Wales, what he calls the land of Arthur and Merlin, it is a season of such earnest and widespread cordiality, such warm enthusiasm, such hearty congratulations between man and man that I have been nowhere equally impressed with the geniality and joyousness of the time. So for Sykes, it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any more joyous than Christmas in Wales. There's a lot of joy, a lot of goodwill to all men and women going around. There were no Scrooges in Wales at the time, or certainly none that Sykes encountered. Just fun and laughter. And to quote, he says that in some Catholic countries, one sees more merriment on the day itself Indeed, the day itself is not especially merry in Wales, at least in its outdoor aspects. It is the season rather than the day which is merry in Wales. And I did touch upon this in last year's Christmas episodes, if you would like to go back and check those out afterwards. But the day itself was quite sacred. People were up and about in the early hours of the morning to celebrate the birth of Christ. It wasn't all debauchery. There was the good Christian aspect to it. But what Sykes is telling us is that really, for Wales, it wasn't about Christmas Day. It was about Christmas season. And that the Welsh people not only make much of the 12 days, but they extend the peculiar festivities of the season 
far beyond those limits. So while other places might make a big fuss on Christmas Day itself, maybe Christmas Eve, and others might make even more of it and celebrate for 12 days, in Wales we go even further. We said no, 12 days, that isn't enough, because as Sykes explains again, Christmas has fairly begun in Wales a week or two before Christmas Day. In fact, the Waits, which is a gang of musicians, are patrolling the streets of Cardiff, we are told, as early as December the 5th. And Christmas festivals are held as early as December the 19th, at which Christmas trees are displayed and their boughs denuded with the toys and lollipops in which the juvenile hearts delight. After Christmas Day, the festival continues, I know not just how long, but apparently for weeks. So, to recap that quickly, we talk nowadays of Christmas gets earlier and earlier every year. We blame consumerism for making us stock up nice and early. But even in the Victorian age, Sykes is telling us that in Cardiff, at least, they were celebrating from as early as December the 5th. And then afterwards, after Christmas, it went on for so long that he couldn't find an end point. So when I described it as the never-ending Christmas, maybe that was true. Maybe that was literally. We have no idea when it starts, when it ends. Maybe it doesn't end. Maybe it's just one long, continuous Christmas, 12 months a year. But however long Christmas went on for, what actually happened at these endless Christmases? Well, to begin with, it's very traditional, Sykes tells us, more so than the neighbouring countries in Britain. And he says that the characteristics of the Christmas season are, he tells us, in the main, alike in all Christian countries. But in Wales, many well-known old customs are retained, which in some other parts of Great Britain, in Scotland and in England, have disappeared, such as the mummers, the waits, carols, bell ringings, etc. Now, far be it from me to contradict Sykes, but some of those customs, if not all of those customs, are very much still alive in places in England and in Scotland, and if anything, are probably more established there than they are in Wales. But one aspect of all of this which did particularly flourish in Wales is everyone's favourite horse-skulled visitor, and that is the Mary Lloyd. Now, I won't dwell too much on the Mary Lloyd here because I spoke about her quite recently. And again, if you'd like to check that out afterwards, that was episode 79. But I think it's safe to say that there aren't many countries in the world where you can find somebody carrying a horse's skull door to door to challenge their neighbours to a battle in rhyme in order to gain entry to their house to drink their ale and eat their cake. But if we look at the other traditions on that list that Sykes mentioned, there are bell ringers, he tells us, which sounds much more respectable than the Mary Lloyd, doesn't it? But not only do the bell ringers of the several churches do their handsomest on their own particular bells, but there are grand gatherings at special points of all the bell ringers from leagues around who vie with each other in showing what feats they can perform, how they can astonish you with their majors, bob majors and triple majors on the brazen clangers of the steeples, which is a lovely poetic way of describing what goes on. But if you stop and try and imagine this sound, I don't know if it would be magical or an absolute nightmare because what Sykes is telling us is that yes we may love a bit of bell ringing at Christmas it's very traditional but when it gets competitive when there are bell ringers competing with each other trying to outdo the other ones showing off and this noise is ringing non-stop then maybe it's not so much a Christmas tradition, but more of a Christmas headache. And as such, if 
competitive Christmas bells are not your thing, then you really wanted to avoid Cowbridge in the Vale of Glamorgan because it's there, we are told, the ringers of Aberdeer, Penarth, St. Fagans, Flantrissant, Flanblethian, and other places, 30 or 40 in number, all get together. So the bell ringers from what could be 40 different places, 40 different places get together. And after they have rung until the air above the town is black with flying clefts and quavers from the steeples, they will all sit down to a jolly Christmas dinner at the bear. Which must be great for the bear. That's a pretty packed pub, I imagine. 40 lots of bell ringers getting together. But for the locals, you might want to get some Victorian earplugs. Because it might have sounded a little bit like this. Okay, they probably sounded a bit more chaotic than that, and a bit better, but that is my last rubbish sound effect of the year, so indulge me this one last time, it's Christmas. So, anyway, back to the music making, and another group making a noise, presumably not quite as much noise as the bell ringers were, the Bands of Waits, who were, in inverted commas, the Pipers of the Watch, who wake the echoes of the early morning with their carols. And they are heard in every Welsh town and village. So in every Welsh town and village, the Pipers of the Watch are bringing their carols to the people. And much like with the bell ringers, there is also a healthy competition between them. And going off on a quick tangent, but Wales is known as the land of song now. It's, it's got this worldwide reputation as being the land of song. And that can also be traced back to roughly this time when there was also rivalry between choirs, like the very well-known male voice choirs. And this competition between them was a healthy competition because it forced them all to up their games. They wanted to outdo their rivals, so they had to get better. But not only did this help raise standards, it also resulted in fisticuffs in some cases. Big fights would break out over rivals. So it's not just bell ringers and groups of weights, but they're singers as well. And people think Football rivalry is bad nowadays, but that is nothing compared to musical rivalry in Wales. And this is something Sykes picks up on at the time when he's talking about these weights, these pipers of the watch, where in some towns there are several of these bands and much good-natured rivalry. And he tells us that the universal love of music among the Welsh saves the weights from degenerating into the woebegone creatures they are in some parts where the custom has that poor degree of life which can be kept in by shivering clusters of bawling beggars who cannot sing. So there's quite a bit to unpack there as well. But what Sykes is telling us is that such was the level of commitment and expertise in Wales. You were guaranteed a high level of carol singing, whereas in other places it had simply become what he describes as a form of begging. And he seems to explain this by suggesting that the Welsh have some innate ability to create great music, some God-given gift to bring this music into the world for the joy of all. And he goes on to say that so fine was the singing that regularly organised and trained choirs of Welshmen preambulate the Cambrian countryside, chanting carols at Christmas time and bands of musicians play who, in many cases, would not discredit the finest military orchestras. Carols are sung in both Welsh and English, and generally the weights are popular. 
And on the subject of weights on these bands of musicians, Sykes does suggest an explanation as to why they were so good, beyond the fact that he thinks all Welsh people are naturally gifted in music. But another explanation might be, to quote Sykes, if their music had been not good, they are not tolerated. Irate gentlemen attack them savagely and drive them off. And that is certainly one way to get rid of the rubbish singers, isn't it? Attack them savagely and drive them off. Although, just to add, you don't have to attack them savagely with your fists. The pen is mightier than the sword, as they say, and they can be attacked by writing a letter to the editor. And we are told that in the local press, strong language is hurled at them as intolerable nuisances, ambulatory disturbers of the night's quiet, and inflictors of suffering upon the innocent. Wonderful use of language there to describe a Welsh person who can't sing, who can't create wonderful music. They are an inflictor of suffering upon the innocent. So it's safe to say bad musicians are not tolerated. But Sykes does go on to say that, but such cases are rare. Of course, because everyone in Wales can sing. Well, except for me, but such cases are rare. The music is almost invariably good, and the effect of the soft strains of melodiously warbled Welsh coming dreamily to one's ears through the darkness and distance on a winter morning is sweet and soothing to most ears. Sometimes small boys will pipe their carols through the keyholes. And I know it's very easy to look back with rose-tinted glasses, but the idea of people just walking around singing in the mornings, maybe as you rush out of the house to go to work, and there they are singing you carols on the way, I think is a lovely way to start the day on those cold, breezy winter mornings. Now, we've established there was lots of music and merriment on the streets, maybe a bit of drunkenness, and no bad music was tolerated, but... What music did they play? Well, unsurprisingly, religious songs were the most prevalent. It was Christmas after all, Christ's Mass. And Sykes did record the lyrics of one, which I am sure will be a little bit familiar to many of you. And fear not, I will not attempt to sing it myself, but I will read it to you. And if you do know the tune, then by all means, hum along with me. And it goes like this. As I sat on a sunny bank, a sunny bank, a sunny bank, all on a Christmas morning, three ships came sailing by, sailing by, sailing by. Who do you think was in the ships? Who do you think was in the ships? Christ and the Virgin Mary. Now, this song is sung in both English and Welsh. Sadly, Sykes doesn't record the Welsh version for us, and sometimes a group of young men and women will be seen dancing about the weights to the measure of their music late into the night and the early hours of the next day. So while the day might start with a carol to send you on your way, it is also wrapped up with some presumably more boisterous singing and a bit of dancing well into the early hours of the next day. And maybe I mentioned in Wales that Christmas can seem endless. It can seem never ending. We don't know when it starts. We don't know when it finishes. Maybe the same could be said about the music. It is the land of song and you hear it First thing in the morning when you leave your house and you can dance and get merry to it last thing at night before you go to bed. And on that note, I think it's time for me to get my dancing shoes on, to get my clogs on, because Christmas is looming. The big day is nigh. And before I leave you all to go off dancing and singing and getting merry and making the most of the season, it just leaves me to say... Thank you for joining me on this podcast, whether you're a long-term listener who's been with me all year or whether you've just 
stumbled across it and you're wondering what the hell I'm going on about, thank you for your support. And as always, if you have enjoyed it, please consider hitting the subscribe button. If you'd like more folklore and more festive folklore, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. And if you really enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, you can now treat me to a coffee via my website, which is always greatly appreciated. Or you can just give it a quick thumbs up or five stars or nice review or whatever the options are on whatever platform you're consuming this on. Think of it as a Christmas present. Finally, as well as a podcast, I've also published a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops offline and on, which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been the festive edition of my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Nadolig Llawen are blithing now with the and God bless us, everyone. No star. <laughs> <laughs>